WT17000, the enigmatic black skull, or Australopithecus aethiopicus, is the first evidence we have of the beginning of this robust lineage of Australopithecines. This lineage that shows increasing size of the masticatory apparatus, huge teeth and jaws, huge chewing muscles. But it actually isn't the first historically. The first evidence historically we have of this robust lineage comes from South Africa. You'll recall that the Cradle of Humankind is an area northwest of Johannesburg and Pretoria in South Africa that has dozens of fossil hominin sites, some of which we've already talked about, such as Sturkfontein, which gave us the first evidence of Australopithecus africanus. There are a number of sites, and including actually the cave of Swartkrons, which is just across the valley from Sturkfontein, which have yielded abundant evidence of these robust Australopithecines. Recall also this area of just northwest of Johannesburg and Pretoria, uh, here in South Africa. There are several other locations in South Africa that have yielded some evidence of these robust Australopithecines as well. But the key sites that we'll talk about are Swartkrons, Chrome Dry, and Drimelin. Now recall that we have evidence of Australopithecus africanus extending back perhaps more than three million years in South Africa, and continuing to at least two and a half million years with specimens such as this, STS-5 from the cave of Sturkfontein. However, shortly after that period, or at least sometime after that period, we get specimens such as this on the left, SK-48 from the cave of Swartkrans. Again, these are separated by just a few miles geographically, and they might be separated by a few hundred thousand years in terms of their geological position, but we can see significant differences between these two specimens. If we look at SK-48, compared to STS-5, we see that that breadth across the midface has expanded even more than it was in STS-5. We have these huge flaring zygomatics. Like STS-5, they're rooted very deep on the maxilla, just above the actual dentition themselves, but they've gotten much larger, and we can see this hollowing out, actually, of the face associated with this expansion of the zygomatic laterally. So SK48, it turns out, is representative of a different species in South Africa. Not Australopithecus africanus, but Australopithecus robustus. It's the first named lineage we have for these robust Australopithecines. And the robustity refers to the size of the masticatory apparatus. The fact that these specimens have even larger teeth than Australopithecus africanus, even larger chewing muscles, even larger structures associated with this whole process of mastication. The earliest specimen that we actually assigned to Australopithecus robustus is this jaw from the side of Chrome Dry, again just a short distance from Sturkfontein and Swartkrans, TM1517. Looking at this specimen, you can see it has nice elongated molars, expanding actually in length as we move down the molar row from M1 to M3. They're also quite broad, and again, they expand in their breadth from M1 to M3 as well in this context. But note that the P4 is almost as large as the first molar. In other words, again, we have evidence of these molarized premolars, one of the trademark characteristics of these robust Australopithecines. As we move later in the evolution of the robust Australopithecines, though, we can see these features exaggerated to a high degree. Here's a later specimen from Swartkrans, SK23, where we can see that now those premolars have gotten even larger. So in this case, the breadth of the second premolar is even larger than that of the first molar. And we can see the same process extending all the way up actually into the first premolar, the P3 here, which again shows expanded size. Moving down the molar row, we can see that the M2 and M3 remain incredibly long and large teeth. Note also that the enamel on these specimens is very thick. Meanwhile, if we look at the anterior dentition, the canine and incisors on these specimens, we can see that the space available for them is very minimal. In fact, in lots of Australopithecus robustus specimens, we see evidence of dental crowding. You can see that here, where the second lateral incisor is kind of tucked in behind the central incisors. This is oftentimes what we see in the robust Australopithecines, again indicating the prioritization of the post-canine teeth. The prioritization of these huge chewing teeth, the premolars and the molars located laterally on the jaw. Here we see that specimen in lateral view, and you can see again corresponding with this is this very, very tall ascending ramus. It has this very tall vertical ramus, again perhaps associated with large chewing muscles. The masseter muscles connect here on the side of the jaw and are associated again with the primary up and down lever movements of the jaw itself. Again, we don't have much of a chin like all of these early hominins, uh, but you can see the long molar teeth and you can see in fact that the M3 is tucked away here actually fully behind the ascending ramus. Looking again at a few of these specimens in lateral view, here again is SK48 on the left, SK83 on the right, we can see in lateral view actually the dramatic expression of these features. The zygomatic arch is this big, almost wave-like structure, reflective of the, again, perhaps large muscular forces placed upon it. Also notice that if the masseter muscles here attaching to the bottom of the zygomatic and then connecting into the jaw down 
inferiorly from this, notice that the angle of action extends right through these molars. The angle of action, in other words, of the masseter is directly in line with the molars, giving these organisms maximum efficiency in chewing through the molar teeth. The same thing is true with SK83 here, where again, if the jaw is situated just inferiorly right here, the angle of action of that masseter is bringing you right in line with the molars, these expanded chewing teeth. Again, suggesting a certain prioritization of efficiency in chewing, especially associated with these big buckled chewing teeth. Looking anteriorly, we can see more variation here in these specimens. Again, SK48 on the left, a specimen from the side of Dremelin here on the right. This specimen from Dremelin, DNH7, is thought to be a female. SK48 is more ambiguous in its sexual classification. It could possibly be female, suggesting a large range of female variation in the specimens, or it could be a small male, suggesting that there's a lot of variation in the male specimens. Or it could simply represent something intermediate, either male or female, suggesting that both sexes are variable, and that Australopithecus robustus in general has a large amount of sexual dimorphism. But again, you can see the breadth across the face in the Dremelin specimen. You can see this huge jaw that corresponds with it. It almost looks like it doesn't fit onto the specimen given its huge size, given the small size of the skull itself. Uh, looking at the Dremelin specimen more closely, here you can see in lateral view, again, this wave-like big wide zygomatic arch, again associated with this chewing muscle going straight through the buccal teeth of the jaw. Notice that the zygomatic comes forward anteriorly to the point where it actually extends anterior to the profile of the face itself, so that it projects out here in front of the face itself. That gives the face itself kind of a concave look. It's sort of shoveled out a little bit. Again, this is characteristic of all of the robust australopithecines. This dished out appearance of the face is something that again reflects the anterior movement of the zygomatics, moving that chewing muscle forward, and the posterior movement of the jaw expanding and creating additional space for these big molar teeth. Looking at the superior view, again you'll notice that there's this huge space for the temporal fossa, a huge space for the muscle of the temporalis to occupy, filling in this entire space within the zygomatic arch. Again, indicative of the huge muscle forces with muscle fibers extending posteriorly and anteriorly onto the skull, occupying essentially this entire region, lateral region of the skull. We can look at more variability of these specimens from Dremelin, DNH7, the mandible associated with that specimen that we just looked at on the left, DNAH, a larger specimen associated on the right. This possibly represents male and female variation, with a larger DNAH specimen representing a male, and the smaller DNH7 specimen representing a female. Noticed in both cases, the huge amount of space occupied again by the premolars and molars, and the tiny space available for those anterior chewing teeth. Again, there's a huge prioritization of that chewing ability. Clearly, Australopithecus robustus is prioritizing its ability to chew, to chew effectively, and to chew frequently. So these large teeth suggest some kind of evolutionary selection for long duration or long extended chewing life. Again, when you wear through your teeth, you pretty much lose the ability to survive. Now, there's other interesting remains from the Australopithecus robustus specimens aside from the fossils themselves. This specimen, SK1585, is one of a number of preserved endocasts from the South African cave sites. Recall that we've already seen an earlier endocast from Australopithecus africanus from the Tong child. This one comes from the cave of Swartkrans, and there are a number of features that we can notice about this specimen. First of all, it shows a slight expansion in brain size. Australopithecus robustus, if we look across the sample, actually shows larger brain size than Australopithecus africanus. This might be the reflection of simply evolution of increasing brain size across a single lineage. Australopithecus robustus may in fact simply be a later derived version of Australopithecus africanus, or at least descend from Australopithecus africanus. But there are a number of features of this endocast in addition to its large size which suggest some derivation. A little bit more development of the frontal lobe, some increasing complexity on the lateral margin of this endocast, as well as perhaps the formation of increased convolutions on the posterior side, all of which might indicate increased complexity and increased neurological capabilities of these specimens. Regardless, Australopithecus robustus again contributes to the large amount of variation that we have in these early hominins from South Africa. Australopithecus robustus historically is the earliest of the robust lineages that we have seen, although geologically it might fall after Australopithecus africanus, and likewise after Australopithecus aethiopicus that we've already seen in East Africa. Now we're about to look at the robust lineage that exists in East Africa, perhaps at the same time period, perhaps slightly later in time as Australopithecus robustus. Those are specimens that we'll refer to in a moment as Australopithecus boisei.